Chapter 17 Life is just one damned thing after another. Albert Hubbard, 1856-1915 From Sirius Schmendrick, 4428 at AOL.com Subject, Entropy To Lori Solomon, 6697 at Yahoo.com Lori, do you roll with it? I've begun to roll with it. Whatever it may be at any time that it feels it must be, I acknowledge, I accept, I embrace. I do not become overshadowed by its omnipotence. I instead become one with it, for it is a force meant to guide, not suppress. And I am finding that by being one with that force, I indeed am the force, and I am, in essence, my own compass in the seemingly random and directionless realm of being. So I ask again, Lori, do you roll with it? You're very close, my friend. Be water, Rutherford. Lori's energy levels had fallen. She was dragging herself through the long days, and she was falling face first onto her neglected, squalid bed covers in the early evenings. She wasn't convinced that only the tiresome hours spent studying were draining her. She believed that it had more to do with the ongoing game of seedy seduction played out like a cat and mouse team in an early Saturday morning kids cartoon. Every 15 to 20 minutes, every day, Lori would walk with Haitian zombie-like glassy eyes to her computer. She would click on the mouse to have the pointer open her email inbox. And she would invariably find two, sometimes three messages from Nick, sent seconds apart from one another. Each harbored the same general adolescent insanity. Each was invasively personal, and yet at the same time, each was perversely distant. Any messages today? Marta would ask over the phone. Lori could picture her stabbing, smiling blue eyes glaring knowingly at the other end of the receiver. She would wait quietly but anxiously for her fill of vicarious indulgence. Marta was one of the few people that Lori felt she could discuss her smoky, charcoal-black secret with in the absence of any real judgment. Marta had her own demonic possession and war-torn troops of heartless incubi to battle, drawn as she had been to her European versions of the shamelessly unavailable or just the downright mean. The proverbial nice guy had always been upstaged by the intoxicating power of the elusive in Marta's life and the beautiful brunette often found herself frustrated and alone. Time and time again, she was sucked into the web of several regular vagabonds in her life, such as the arrogant, commitment-phobic Swiss guy who would periodically toss her a crumb before shoving the whole pie in her face. Thanks for taking me out, Marta had said one day in a quaint little outdoor cafe, nudging her hash browns and bacon with her fork. Well, I'm just sorry it's been so long since we last did this, Thomas said. But something just keeps making me reluctant to approach you, you know, to be with you. Marta felt her stomach tighten. What do you mean? He threw his napkin down on his plate. I don't know, he said, sighing. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. I don't know, Marta. What don't you know? Looking deep into his eyes, she had begun to blindly carve the edges of a poached egg with her butter knife. What? I, he started, I love you. She blushed and looked down at the sheared egg white on her plate. She pushed the pieces together and started to stack them while she tried to absorb what he had just told her. Her heart had been beating furiously in her chest, her palms beady with sweat. But, he said, I'm not in love with you. She stared into his eyes again and felt the color drain from her face. She scooped up the napkin that lay on her lap and tossed it down on the table. Thank you for the brunch, she said, rising to leave. You may now go and screw yourself. And there was the shady, internet-obsessed Italian who occasionally surfaced for air like a porpoise before diving deep and out of reach into the sea for weeks or months. Martha would find him online at all hours of the day, sending and receiving instant messages to and from a myriad of hypothetical girls or guys whose relationships to him would forever remain a mystery to her. She forwarded a series of instant messenger interactions to Lori. Mateo S., let's meet. Mateo S., pretty please. 
Mateo S. with cherries on top? Mateo S. ignoring me? Marta G. Um, I thought you were pissed at me. Mateo S. I always am. You don't want to meet me? Mateo S. LOL. Marta G. I almost forgot what you look like. Mateo S. You know what I look like, and I sure know what you look like and smell like. Marta G. You're in heat, aren't you? Mateo S. When I think about you, I am. Mateo S. Not kidding, Marta. Marta G. Okay. Mateo S. Okay what? Mateo S. Am I annoying you? Marta G. What do you think? Marta G. First you aren't talking to me and now you're hot for me? What gives? Mateo S. I asked you out twice and you said you would call but never did. Marta G. That's not how I remember it. Mateo S. Well, that is the way it was. Mateo S. I was so looking forward to seeing you again. Marta G. I had told you that I had a funeral to go to back in Italy. You weren't very understanding. Mateo S. And the time before that? Marta G. I don't recall a time before that. Mateo S. Anyway, I have to admit I miss you a lot. Marta G. Are you pulling my leg? Mateo S. No, Marta. Mateo S. I get all hot and steamy just thinking about how well we kissed together. Mateo S. But you know that already. Marta G. Well, yeah. Mateo S. But it is like pulling teeth trying to hook up with you. Marta G. Deep down I miss you too, but can't just see each other in person twice a year. Marta G. Don't you ever crave more? Marta G. Mateo? Marta G. Mateo, are you still there? After apparently not putting out to Mateo's satisfaction one evening because Marta claimed she needed time to get to know him better as a person, he began avoiding her by not sending her his usual instant messages at times when she could plainly see that he was online. Then one special evening, the silence broke with an expression of concern on Mateo's part over not having heard from Marta for so long. His heartfelt display of attention and sincerity was immediately followed by a request to see her again. Marta realized that perhaps it was she who wronged him. P perhaps she wasn't as available to him as she could have been or should have been. She eagerly accepted his invitation and then found herself twiddling her thumbs alone in her apartment and staring angrily at her quiet phone on the Tuesday night. They were tentatively scheduled to see one another. Then she faced another month or so of internet silence before Mateo returned once more to ask her point blank in an instant message why she blew him off. Her reply was that she was heavily engrossed in filing her nails and she would appreciate if he would go screw himself. Whereas Marta's reasons for being innkeeper of her own moron motel were unclear, Lori believed that the darkness she herself was drawn to may have been some kind of an attempt to conquer a modern-day reincarnation of lost, tainted loves and old-time bullies. Nick Warren seemed to be the hell-selected envoy of everything in her life that had gone wrong, everything in her life she never forgave herself for allowing to go wrong. Nothing came closer to the truth than her friend Angela's drunkenly spewed philosophy to Natalie on that one grim New Year's Eve. You've got to stop letting the dickheads run and ruin your life. You keep inviting the dickheads in. I keep inviting the dickheads in because they remind us of all those other dickheads who were there before them. And we think we can change them, and we try to change them, because we never had the chance to change the other dickheads. And by having a new dickhead to change, we're being given another chance. She started to read a message from Rutherford. From Sirius Schmendrick 4428 at AOL.com, subject foot odor, to Lori Solomon 6697 at Yahoo.com. Woe to them, be that not believe, for thy bed be waft with a foul pox. No light doth have them for a road, when cleaved in twain, an enemy of God, nor a fixture bearing the hands of angels, shall be the place to set their towels when damp. What do you think? For the last couple of days, I've been reading the Bible and the Koran, and I've concluded that as long as you write stuff with weird words like hath and thou and doth, you're bound to get some followers. In a word, I'm thinking of founding a new religion. I just need to find a group of people to hate. Hatred is an interesting theme in these books. 
Incidentally, in the Bible, the Egyptians and the Romans are the bad guys. And in the Quran, you only have to read about two pages before it mentions that the Jews are wicked. Woe be it to the children born of the foot of the Alps, for they are unbelievers, and doth barter a wedge of racklet for twice the market price and giggle. God hates them for this. Let me know if you want to join my cult. Rutherford. Lori's phone rang. Hey, it's me. Hey, Lori said. What are you doing now? Studying. Did you get my last email? Nick asked. No, I haven't had a chance to check. Why? What does it say? Read it, he said. Okay. Guess I better let you get back to studying now, he said. All right. Bye. He quickly hung up the phone. From Nick Warren. You warm? Laurie stared long and hard at his message, just one of the many hollow, echoing cries of superficiality that she found herself completely unable to ignore. She wondered when this was all going to come to an end, and she wondered how she would feel when, in fact, it finally did. From Laurie Solomon 6697 at yahoo.com. For this, you called me? From Nick Warren 557 at hotmail.com. Yeah, I wanted to know if you were getting warm. Lori paused. She knew that this would only come to an end when she made it come to an end. Yet what kind of an ending did she want? How was she going to make it happen? More importantly, did she really want it to happen? Did she really want it to end?